Keith Evans is our guest today. He's the former owner of the Watermark Gallery in Chicago's Arts District. Welcome, Keith. The Gulf Coast of Florida is teeming with artists in, of every genre. How would I get my work into the gallery? What does it take to qualify? Okay, thank you, Nancy. First, we have to decide what we mean by genre or media or medium in art. Each piece that we work with in art is considered um, a medium. You have painting, you have sculpture, you have fine art printmaking, you have photographs. There runs a gamut of these types of materials. So there's no one such thing as art. There's just the various mediums within the field of art. How does an artist get selected, therefore? Well, one thing is the gallery usually focuses on a particular genre, as you called it, or medium. They're either specialists in sculpture, they're specialists in fine art prints, they're specialists in paintings. They do that because of their audience. So once that's known, once, once you understand that a gallery, for instance, is a painting gallery, uh, the artist has to approach the gallery at that point. And there's several levels at which this needs to be discussed. The first is the artist needs to know what the gallery is offering and why they offer it. The second thing is that the gallery needs to realize there's exhibitions scheduled throughout the year and so that there may be three exhibitions a year, four exhibitions, eight exhibitions. The artist has to understand that these things are scheduled in advance and they're not going to walk in and get their pieces on the wall generally right away. So they need to know the exhibition schedule and they need to know that many galleries are at least six months out if not a year to year and a half out on the product that they're going to show. The artist then has to determine how he's going to how he or she is going to approach the marketplace, approach the gallery. Gallery owners first of all do not want artists coming to openings and bringing their works or bothering them uh, and approaching them during an opening. It's an important time. You're showing your work to a group of people that you've invited to the gallery. It may be 100, 200. We used to have up to 400 people um, at, our, at our openings, and that's not the time to talk to an artist. The artist probably, in my estimation, needs to send a, a cover letter and a resume or an email in these days just explaining who they are, what their background is, what art they perform, which one of those mediums they're proficient in, painting, printmaking, and then um, send, in this day and age, most artists have CDs, and they will then send a CD of their work along. Is that, excuse me, is that along with the cover letter? Yes, yes. Okay. Gen, gen, well, and, and if it's in an email, obviously those things work together. But generally, in, back in Chicago, and the Watermark Gallery was in business from 2008 to 2011, um, we had people who came in and handed off CDs to us, basically. And that's okay, that's good, uh, but generally gallery owners are so busy trying to cull their mailing list, trying to think of the next exhibition, uh, selecting art, paying bills, uh, washing the floors and windows, <laughs> that there's so much going on that it's better to contact someone via mail. So that's the first thing is understanding the genre of art, understanding what the gallery specializes in and then how best to approach the gallery. I think in most businesses, whether you're a writer or an artist, what you need to do is not go up, shake their hand, and say, remember me, but follow the steps to do it right. In other words, people will say to me, well, you know, I mentioned to you that I was going to have an exhibition. Well, you know what? I love it because if I'm busy, I'll shake my head and say, oh, that's nice, and I'm not even registering this because my thoughts are somewhere else. So people really, at any age, they need to realize that they have to go through certain channels and follow certain rules. I know with writers, they need to learn to read the guidelines. Right. I think it's, it's important because not it, it's like anybody's workplace. We have a lot of things to do daily, and, and that interruption for many people is, is a diversion, mm -hmm. unfortunately. And you want to pretty much stay on course. And a gallery has so many, so many invitations to review artists' work. I mean, and that's the one thing Mae West said, too many men, not enough time. We say in the art business, too much art, not enough buyers. There's just too much going on out there. Let me ask you something. Earlier when we were talking, you mentioned something that I thought was so cute, and I would like for you to go into that for our listening audience. But you mentioned refrigerator artists. Yeah, that's uh, it's not a negative term, but it's one way to describe the industry and the business of art and how people go about determining what is good and what is bad in art. Uh, many people say beauty is in the eye of the beholder. 
older. And that may be the case, but art, art itself, and, and again, I, I now use the term art as those pieces, paintings, fine art prints, and so forth, have, have I believe they have a criteria for becoming what is called art. And what we think of art is, is that is the product that ascends above all else. In, in two respects, as far as I'm concerned, the first thing is the art must have the skill and the craftsmanship applied to it, that the person using the medium knows how to use the materials. That's the first thing. You see so much junk out there that people throw on a canvas or push uh, ink through a silk screen, and it's just bad, period. It doesn't qualify. The f so the first thing is technically sound. The second part of it is, does it have that message? Does it have the ability to rise above just something to look at? So when I say refrigerator art, the stuff that mom and dad or grandma and grandpa may put on the refrigerator and point to and say, isn't that beautiful, is in of itself not art. Okay, it becomes picture. And the reason for distinguishing these is so many galleries get into the idea that if they show something new, that it's going to be art. If they show a new artist, a new technique, that this is going to be art. And it's not necessarily true that it is quote unquote art. It may just be pictures. And so that's why I say refrigerator artists need not fly. I've found that I think in order to be an artist, you not only have to have the ability, but you have to be able to create something unique. And I think sometimes that's why you'll go into, um, say, a modern art gallery. Well, the one that stands out in my mind is the person standing there with oil poured over their head, and it's dripping. This came across to me on Facebook, and I don't really like to criticize, but I did have to ask them, what is this? Because right. I don't see this as art. Right. And that becomes the, um, I'll say the problem between those people who feel that's art and those people who don't. Because those who feel that that experience is art will give you many reasons on what art is and what art isn't. Most of us think in the terms, obviously, of physical art and not necessarily performance art, per se. So, Are you uh, thinking fine art yeah, as in, opposed? Well, this many people consider the paintings as the traditional arts and so forth. And so, so something that you have as an experience, like pouring oil over your head and then saying this is art, for those people, they can tell you what the meaning is behind it. And they're probably right. There is a message behind there, and that's what is the ascension to art. Can you rise above? Is there a message here? Even in, in Jan Van Meer's paintings where he uses light back in the, in the, uh, in the Renaissance, he uses light to soften portray a figure. It's just basically a portrait, but so we get so much more from just that portrait, and that's the part that arises to art. Pouring oil over your head, someone may be able to, um, to vindicate that action as art. I don't necessarily see that mm -hmm. myself. Do you have any advice for a potential gallery owner? When I came out of college, I saw a beautiful building in the Comas. It was for sale. It had been recently updated, although it was gutted and it had no electricity or water or interior walls. But I thought, oh my, this would make a wonderful gallery. And when I talked to my favorite professor about this, he said, you know, Nancy, this really isn't a good time to open a gallery. So for someone who wants to open a gallery, what advice could you give them? Well, first, uh, you don't quit your day job because <laughs> there's no immediate success in art. The art gallery business is a labor of love. You do it because it excites you and because there are rewards when you have your openings and people come and you enjoy them and you enjoy the artist and you enjoy the artist and your, your clientele getting together. That's the important thing. But in opening a gallery, there's, there's nothing more than opening up a grocery store or a dry cleaner. You have rent to consider. You have location, obviously, to consider. You have the renovations that you have to make, that you may have to make in the space. You have the cost of exhibition, hanging your pieces, any kind of signage that's related to that, and so forth. You will have the salaries of your gallery owner and anybody who comes in to help who doesn't volunteer their time. You will have advertising costs. You'll have to go out in, in, in various uh, brochures and books that they put around the city. You may have to go into uh, some newspapers, some magazines to get the word out about your gallery. And then you have promotion. Promotion being basically your events where people come and there you have to cater food 
um, and do other kinds of things. You may even have entertainment and so forth that you have to pay for. So this is not unlike any other company. The one thing I found out, though, in our business generally is that landlords are very savvy, and they know exactly to the penny what you're going to make as a gallery owner, and they charge the highest they can for your space. And generally, it is the rent that you pay in your location um, that sends most galleries out of business. Mm -hmm. The rents are just too high to try to do art at a, at a layman's level. Right. I know most businesses that do fail, the majority of them fail because they were underfinanced to begin with. They didn't allow themselves enough months where they wouldn't be making any money, and so they go out very quickly. Could you share a couple of experiences that you had in the business? Uh, the excitement of the place that we had in Chicago, we were on the south side uh, near the University of Illinois in a, in a small enclave of, oh, about 500 artists, they tell me, in about 32 galleries. But it was a bohemian uh, style for the most part. And uh, we came in with about five or six gallery owners and uh, did a little bit more than, than they had done before. The spaces were very nice. And so that was, that was an experience of looking at this property, making the decision that you're going to do it, then deciding to do it, and then uh, finally going ahead and doing the renovations. Most of the work that I did, I, I specialize in, I enjoy, is the renovation of the space and the exhibition design. We had a, an interesting system where we could put panels on the wall and also put them on the floor showing our art. It's a system that I had designed, and that was kind of interesting. Uh, and, and an experience, of course, because now you're in the business of almost industrial design or product design. Can you find the materials? Where do you find them? Where do you find them for less? Can you find used materials? Can you file borrow? Because as I said earlier, so many of these galleries, the money goes to the landlord. You have to basically be frugal on, on how you do at this level. Mm -hmm. You know, once you're in business for, for 15, 20 years and you have clientele and you're selling pieces for ten to $20,000, it's a whole different game. Mm -hmm. But in our gallery, we had pieces at about uh, $100 to maybe $300, $400. Not that these pieces were not good, that's not why they were priced like that, but it was more that that was the marketplace for the kinds of pieces that we had. So experiences, one endearing experience was there was a homeless man on our streets. At first glance, you wouldn't generally engage this man in conversation. A fairly aggressive kind of a, of a gentleman and so forth. Over the first three or four months, he had approached me for, uh, for some loans, and which I refused. But then what I said to him, Louis, was I said, Louis, why don't you come and work with us? You will work and then I will give you money and that way we both win, win. Yes. and we did that for the three years and it turned out that we uh, formed a very good relationship that was kind of fun um, I don't know Nancy that I have any other f funny things to say accounting is not funny in the business <laughs> as most as most of us know the, here, here are some of the highlights I would say the space that we had was split into two levels it was about 60 feet long and it went out to a one block long yard in back. In Chicago you have alleys, but in our case they took the alley out and put a garden out there. So we had two split levels. It was all glass in back. We had 13 foot ceilings and a skylight. So sun was beautiful. It's, it's just you couldn't have asked for a better location than that. So that was a good experience. We had these Friday nights, second Fridays in Chicago, where we would get about 400, 450 people down, which was wonderful. I mean, you'd see the same people every month, but then again, you'd find some new people. You had new displays. Uh, these ran from about 7 to 10, and at 10 o'clock, you'd grab a group of people and go out to dinner. That was fun. <laughs> Those were exciting kinds of things. Meeting the artists, the ones that we used, mm -hmm. and I think we had some very good good artists uh, that, that we um, showed. Uh, that was great. That was brought. It was a broad spectrum of people, um, and, and they became friends, and we still communicate today. So those are the good experiences. You know, that brings up a question. Um, I know with museums, the lighting is very critical because they're trying to protect the old uh, works of art that they have. Um, but there was a gallery in Venice, and I went in to see it one day. I had an exhibition there. And um, the owner had a, I assume it was a watercolor, um, 
right in the showroom window, and the sun was shining on it directly. And I said to her, don't you worry that the sun won't bleed the color out of that artwork. And apparently she didn't think so. What is your feeling about that? Well, when you get into exhibition design, and, and we have had several companies, uh, one of which uh, was an exhibition exhibit company, a screen printing company that did a lot of work with the Smithsonian when we were back in Washington, D.C. So you learn a lot of things, and we learned a lot of things in those days, did some wonderful jobs uh, for them, worked with them. And when it comes down to UV light, in your case, you're talking about fading, if you have pigments, watercolors especially, that are, um, are mixed with water and thinned down as transparent colors, there's less UV resistance because there aren't that many pigments within that layer of ink versus an opaque layer of ink like you might have with a gouache, an acrylic gouache where you lay it down thickly and you have more pigments there. And most of the pigments in, in, in painting are, are rated excellent as far as light fastness, but UV light is going to get to them. The one thing is you don't put anything in front of a window. The second thing is generally um, in, in a lot of cases, if you're really, really um, trying to prevent that kind of work, even your light system needs to have UV filters over them. But if you're, you're, you know, and that gets to a point where what gallery owner is going to afford that? We're coming short on time, and I have one more question that I'm dying to ask you. Um, with regard to future galleries, you can see how everything's moving very quickly right now. Um, do you see galleries in the future being online rather than physical? Well, the, the marketplace for galleries is, is this, I believe. If you have a, a, a named artist, somebody who has a reputation and has been in the business for a long time, you're going to be selling at 10,000 to whatever. The sky is the limit. And th those galleries will always exist. What happens is you get the, the, the generation of new galleries, younger galleries that come in and think that this would be a great thing to do. And the problem is, as I said earlier, there's too much art and not enough buyers. And so all these galleries will, with, within five years for the most part, um, go defunct. Fail. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I, I think that it's, it's a great thing to have if you can do it, but you have to be in a location, number one, where people are coming. It has to be a destination. People want to eat in the neighborhood, and then they want to go see artwork. That's number one. Number two, you better not be the only art gallery on the block because people are not going to come to you to, for that. They are going to come to an enclave of artists. I believe Burns Court up in Sarasota, up in Sarasota yeah. is that kind of a thing where people can come together, or Palm... Uh, Avenue, I believe it is, in downtown Sarasota, where you have a series of galleries. People are going to congregate on those. They're going to have events. You must have a community of art galleries. You cannot survive on your own. We want to thank uh, Keith Evans, former owner of the Watermark Gallery in Chicago's Art District. Thank you very much, Keith. Thank you, Nancy.